what I'll be talking about today is mostly sort of a, sort of a really deep concern that I've had. I mean, so far, and not about the conference, which has been fantastic, sort of, but this notion of the noosphere. Very often, I mean, sort of, I think about these movies from the '70s, you know, where the aliens were always these enlightened beings of of, of light and using sort of pure crystals to to, to guide humanity towards world peace, etc. And um, sort of our conceptions of the noosphere seem to follow sort of that same idea that there's some kind of a transcendence, some kind of a sort of illumination happening as the noosphere comes about. Um, I think my talk in a sense is a little bit of a, uh, perhaps a little uh, Cassandra style warning that, uh, that instead of utopia, instead of the noosphere, we might end up with what, what I've uh, flippantly called the neurotosphere. Uh, the, you know, if you look at the past uh, 20 years, I think what has come about is that we live in a world of uh, networks, um, the, uh, especially complex networks that are characterized by, you know, their systems of very large number of entities, b b b b people, machines, etc., that interact in non-trivial manners. And these uh, complex networks are characterized by a number of, of parameters or statistics that you can observe, for example, a heavy tail in the degree distribution, high clustering coefficients, um, uh, very high levels of assortativity or disassortativity, uh, community structure and hierarchical structure. That's sort of the official definition of a complex network. And we're all caught up in these networks right now because of how connected our world has become. And um, now that has led many of us to think about sort of the, the ways in which uh, people and machines are, are connected together in terms of a, a, a global network uh, of, of uh, a global network that might uh, a yield uh, an intelligence that is greater than uh, the sum of the parts, which would be uh, humanity itself. Um, in fact, uh, you know, thinking back, and it, this has been a little bit of a ba uh, blast from the past for me, being here with Francis and, 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 and Cliff Jocelyn and the luminaries that I had the, uh, the pleasure to start my academic career with back in the 90s. Um, but I think it's fair to say that when, uh, uh, sort of in the early 90s, when the World Wide Web was coming about, I think that uh, Francis was involved in creating the first Belgian website. So it's a, uh, I mean, it's not necessarily a global uh, milestone, but, but still uh, quite the achievement in 1992, 1993. And so I think we we're all imbued sort of with the spirit of, 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 of innovation. We had sort of this idea of a network utopia, you know, like where um, algorithms, uh, the internet, the way that uh, people would be connected together would yield sort of a, 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 an intelligence that we refer to as the global brain or the noosphere, perhaps, uh, sort of a, a new step in the development of, of humanity where people would be connected to such a degree that, that we, we would essentially be creating a, a, a sort of a, 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 a world sp uh, spanning brain. Um, I mean, whether that has happened or not, you know, I, I refer to Simon Dedeo, who did, did a fantastic uh, research on uh, the edit history of Wikipedia pages. It showed uh, that, um, it performed a finite state machine analysis of the, the, the uh, sequences of edits that were being made and showed that there's definitely indications of a higher intelligence happening as people collectively start to edit Wikipedia pages. So that's the network utopia. And I think it's fair to say that we were all very enthralled with this kind of thinking in the, the early 90s. However, over the past, 15 years, I've come around a little bit to uh, uh, a sort of a more perhaps dystopian view of what's been happening. Instead of a sort of a uh, sort of a de-intermediation where, you know, we'd have all of these middlemen eliminated and people would have direct access to the information that they needed, to the com communication channels that we needed. What we've seen over the past 10 years is that although, you know, 60% of the world population has internet, most of the activity that happens on the internet right now is mediated by a few really large uh, 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 companies, big tech companies like Google, Netflix, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, etc. And what we've seen at the same time is sort of this, you know, DD inter intermediation. We've seen sort of phenomena that could best be described as sort of the madness of the crowd. I don't know how many of you have actually read that, that book by McKay. Uh, it was published in the 19th century, an encyclopedia of human folly, essentially. And we're seeing a lot of that right now. Uh, polarization, misinformation, distraction, uh, extremism, serious um, uh, ethical challenges, but also an assault 
on our collective mental health. Um, you know, Jerry Lanier actually wrote in 2018, uh, he thought it was longer ago, but it was 2018. It's probably because of the intervening pandemic. It felt that this already feels like a different era, but wrote this fantastic little book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Um, you know, I'm happy to say that I was ahead of Jerry because I deleted my social media accounts in 2016 on the, on the basis of our research results indicating uh, that social media was having a, a, a pretty pernicious effect on, uh, on, on all of us. So I want to po point something out here, and I don't know how many of you see, have seen these statistics, but they scared the bejeebus out of me. I mean, I think this is like a, like a code red, you know, you, you expect sirens to go off, but they didn't. So here's what's happening with American youth. Uh, you know, I, I always tell the story like I, I was I entered college in 1989 and I graduated in 1993, 1994. And those are great years. I mean, the this is when the, uh, the house music came, really came on the scene. Kim and so on. The rays were fantastic. There were no phones, but we had we had computers. Um, really good times. But we were not nice. We were naughty. There was a lot of cigarette smoking going on. There was a lot of drinking going on. There's a lot of smoking going on. Just about every single vice that you can imagine uh, was going on in large numbers. Again, perhaps it was just the VUB, perhaps other universities are much clear. <laughs> no? Okay. So anyway, but the, all I'm saying is that if you look at statistics, looking at youth nowadays, you know, they smoke less, they drink less, they, they have sex less, they have uh, less unprotected sex. Uh, they watch less television. And so all of these are indicators that should point towards higher levels of well-being. Uh, but that's not the case at all. If you look at the, sort of the bottom parts of these graphs, you can see that the, the number of uh, uh, young uh, individuals, male or female, you can see that this is gender to a degree, that are reporting uh, persistently, persistently feeling sad or hopeless, seriously considered suicide, made a suicide plan, attempted suicide. If you look at those numbers, I mean, look at the y-axis. So if you draw a line from sort of the 20 to 30 percent, you can see that for, at least for, for, uh, for Amer uh, young women in America, about 20 to 30 percent right now indicates that they seriously considered suicide and made a suicide plan. In fact, recent statistics show that about 40 percent of high school students uh, reported feeling so sad and hopeless that they could not in engage in their regular activities. And these are like absolutely disastrous statistics for a generation that is living cleaner lives than, than, than we could ever imagine in those heady days of the, the late 80s. And so what's happening? What, what is different about this group of people? And so I, I hit it to, to reveal it at the very end. They are very heavy users of smartphone and tablets and social media. That's really what sets this generation apart. And that naturally leads to the intuition or the hypotheses that the two might be related. There may be an association between the two. Um, so, that, so there's a little bit of a social media paradox happening here in the sense that the 82% of the US population uses social media platforms. And, um, you know, during the lockdowns that led to social isolation, you know, social media platforms really a lifeline for a lot of people, allow them to connect to others, etc. And as a social species, we really need these social connection, which is what social media provides. So, but then how is it possible that if you look at the actual data, that social media, which engenders social connectiveness, right, lowers well-being, leads to higher levels of mental health disorders, and this is not just an intuition, it's not just a hypothesis. There's been some meta reviews that indicates that, that social media use is really bad for mental health, especially for our young. I think this is incontrovertible right now that social media platforms have had a disastrous effect on the social media, on the well-being and the mental health of the entire generation. Now, I will say this, though, when it comes to depression and anxiety, sort of the internalizing disorders, there's something really weird going on there as well. Uh, Claude Bochting, uh, uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Amsterdam, published this paper a while ago where they, they did a meta review of papers looking for biomarkers of depression. And they found no, no consistent evidence for any biological uh, markers of depression and anxiety which means that it's not a disease like COVID-19 or cancer or the cardiovascular disease, et cetera. It's very much a disease for which we cannot find any biomarkers. This is like a dynamical process that we can observe that it doesn't have necessarily a disease agent. So what to measure? And if, if anything, in, in the research, our research program at Indiana University, what we've, we've been, what we've been trying to do is figure out what to measure, how to actually approach 
uh, a, a sort of a disorder, a disease that, that does not act like a normal disease where you, don't, you cannot identify a disease agent, but you're looking at sort of a variety of, of, of affective, cognitive, and behavioral symptoms that seem to be intertwined somehow with sort of rising levels of social media use. So we have these social networks on one end, and they're interacting with these individuals whose uh, uh, state, if you will, mental health state or well-being, uh, is shaped by a, a variety of interacting behavioral, affective, and cognitive uh, factors. And so what we've been trying to do in our research lab is, is devise data-driven techniques to observe uh, the affective status of an individual, their behavioral status, but also their cognitive status, to, to, to achieve some kind of a lev leverage on this issue, to perhaps figure out what's happening and, 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 how to, um, uh, uh, and how to prevent it, perhaps. Now, of course, that requires models that account for the complex interactions between these fa factors in the, con in the context of complex networks. So that's a really uh, complicated thing to do, obviously. But the, the, even though social media, to, to a degree, I think, is involved in this pandemic, if you will, of mental health disorders, it also provides us exactly with the data that we may need to study the phenomenon in more detail. I always say that I, I think social media it, it, platforms, to, to largely, have had a, a, a devastating effect on society, but they've had a very positive effect on data scientists like myself because the, the, they allow, they provide us the data that we need to, to, to perform our research. So I'm going to discuss two vignettes here. I'm going to try to stay within time, so I'll, I'll rush through this a little bit, just to give you an inkling of the kind of things that we've been uh, uh, pr uh, trying to do from a data different perspective. So the first thing that you, the, the, the first conundrum, the first issue that we have, and this has been plaguing clinical psychology for, for ages now, is that emotions, emotions are very ephemeral. You cannot observe them. Again, it's really difficult to come up with biomarkers of, of emotions. Sure, you can wear a Fitbit, you can, you can look at people's heart rates, you can look at people People's blood pressure, it's their skin conductance, whatever, but that's not emotions. So the, the, the mostly you measure emotions by asking people how they're feeling, and then they might tell you. So it's very much intertwined with language. The problem is if you ask people frequently how they're feeling, you're going to change how they feel. You might annoy them, you might bore them, you might anger them, you'll change their feelings. It's actually really difficult to, 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 to rely on self-reports to measure feelings, but see, it's really the only option that we have. And so what we uh, have been trying to do is to, uh, uh, to look at text sentiment, look at the text that people write on Twitter, on Facebook, et cetera, and then have the machines read those texts and try to use AI and machine learning to read those texts and then uh, derive markers of the effective state of the individual from the text that they wrote. The question, of course, is that possible? And so what we did is that this is a research, we published this in Nature Human Behavior uh, uh, four or five years ago. And what we did is we looked at Twitter and looked at people that said, I feel terrible, I feel great, expressing sort of very unambiguous, very explicit, positive or negative emotions. And as soon as they did that, back then the Twitter API allowed us to download their entire record of all tweets that they've they've written up to the 3,200 most recent tweets, but most people you know, don't tweet quite that much, so you'd have like four or five years of data. But we weren't interested in four or five years of data. We're interested in the tweets that people posted right before they explicitly reported experiencing an emotional state. So where someone said, like, I feel terrible, we looked at the tweets that were posted preceding that statement to see whether the text the sort of the, the linguistic, the lexical construction of the tweet provided an indication of that underlying feeling. So we're trying to sort of uh, uh, have the computers actually read uh, uh, those tweets, looking for markers of the feeling that the individuals themselves reported in the tweet. So these are naturally occurring emotions that have not been uh, evoked in the lab. And so when we do that, uh, again, I don't want to go too much into methodological details here, but you can immediately see the scale at which this is possible. We did this for 110,000 individuals, which is only a small fraction of the individuals on Twitter. I know their user base has been declining recently, but I wonder why. But the, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the, for social science, these are very large samples of hundreds of thousands of even millions of individuals. In this case, we had 100,000 individuals that said, I feel great, I'm feeling horrible, I feel awful. So we know they told us they were having a feeling, and then we could analyze the tweets that were posted six hours before and six hours after to, to study how a naturally occurring human emotion evolves. And I promise there's some good news here. Um, okay, so let's look at the results. And what we found is that positive emotions last for about an hour and a half. 
So that's good. I mean, it's, that's, that's a, you know, if, before they return to the baseline. So you can see when people say that I'm feeling great, uh, about 20, 30 minutes before they report feeling great, their tweets are already, even though they're not about emotions, but they're already revealing the traces of that emotion, so, sort of escalating to the point that they become aware of it and say, I'm feeling great. The only problem is as soon as you tell people that you're feeling great, the positive emotion returns back to the baseline, so don't do that. When you're feeling great, just stay quiet about it. Always better. <laughs> just don't tell us. Nobody, nobody wants to know. However, the flip side of this is the same happens with negative emotions. You can see it on the right-hand side. You can see how negative emotions, uh, at least as, as, as they are revealed by tweets that were posted before people reported feeling terrible, you can see how that, that negative emotion escalates. By the way, all of these uh, trajectories were, modeled, uh, could, uh, were best modeled by exponential functions, which indicates that there's some kind of some, an escalation happening where the emotion kind of escalates and then reaches a point at which it enters our consciousness and we suddenly notice, I feel terrible. Right? But here's the, here's the good news. When you're feeling bad, it's really good to tell people that you're feeling bad because your emotions will recover very quickly to the baseline. It's called affect labeling. It's a very effective means of emotional regulation. If you want to downregulate a negative emotion, just tell people, but not in too many words. Okay, so don't make a drama. Don't, you know, don't tell people that I feel like my friend stabbed me in the heart with a knife and you know, they threw me under the bus and then, no, don't say that. Just say, hey, I'm not feeling good. That's enough. That will downregulate back. Your brain will downregulate the emotion. Um, whether you do it on Twitter or not, so that's my advice to you. If you're feeling good, shut up about it. If you're feeling bad, just tell somebody in a few words and you feel better soon. Of course, now that we can do that, now we've established that we can measure human emotions from the text that they write, and we've got about a, a billion and a half, two billion people on social media, that means that we can track in real time the emotions of literally billions of people on the planet. So you can literally measure how the noosphere is feeling, at a, uh, is feeling at a particular point in time. We've been able to demonstrate this not just for individual suffering, for example, from bipolar disorder in this case, but we've been able to do this for um, entire societies. This is, these are results that we, uh, this is during the COVID-19 um, pandemic where we looked at 20 US cities and we could track on a, almost a minute to minute scale how those, how those cities, how the populations in those cities were feeling. Uh, at that particular point in time. A, a funny methodological uh, thing here is that if you looked at people tweeting about COVID-19, you would think that the COVID-19 pandemic is making everybody super happy in, uh, in the United States. That is, of course, not what happened. People are posting things about the sort of rousing things about COVID-19. We'll beat this, you know, uh, uh, thanks to our firefighters, thanks to our uh, doctors, etc. All of these would be, you know, you would think would be negative emotions. But if you looked at the tweets where people were not actually tweeting about COVID-19, sort of unguarded tweets where they're not trying to tell people about their emotions or how they felt about COVID-19, you'd see a tremendous, um, a tremendously significant declines of well-being across the United States, across um, uh, um, all US cities. Of course, we've been able to do this for, uh, in terms of community resilience as well. When communities are hit by hurricanes, of course, that, that affects their, their well-being, <laughs> well-being plummets. But you can measure literally the resilience of a community if you're turning back to its baseline, just like we just showed with, with in the case of affect labeling for individuals, that these, in the, that these communi communities can return very quickly back to their baseline uh, if, you know, uh, the, in, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the food supply, et cetera, people are being taken care of. So that, um, um, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, some of this research has actually started for us trying to predict stock market returns. We were actually quite success successful. That worked really well. When investors become scared and they start posting things on Twitter, even if it's not about the stock market, they reveal traces of their own emotion, of their own anxiety. And a couple of days later, you can see that anxiety manifested in the stock market. This is research that we did in 2011. I'm sure some, some hedge funds made a lot of money off of this paper, but I didn't. Uh, still a little sore about that, actually. <laughs> so uh, I wish I could be zooming in for my private Caribbean island, but uh, that's not the case. Uh, anyway, so but the, the one last thing I wanted to talk about is, okay, so that's, I think we, we, we've achieved the capacity if, if we are offered access to the data of measuring sort of the collective emotional state of humanity if we wanted to, which is a tremendously informative data. But it still raises the question, why are people not feeling well? Why is our youth feeling so miserable? What, what is actually uh, happening there? And how does that relate to what we know about depression, anxiety, and internalizing disorders? And so the idea, in, a, in a room like this, I mean, there's not a lot of people here. It's probably, you know, everybody's waiting for lunch break. I, I, I sympathize with that. The, um, the, 
in, in a room of 100 people, at least 20 of them will have been treated for depression and anxiety because the lifetime prevalence for uh, anxiety and depression is about 15 to 20 percent for some demographics, very high. And the gold standard treatment of depression and anxiety is cognitive behavioral therapy, which was invented in the 60s by Beck. And the ten one of the tenets is that, that the uh, depressed individuals exhibit what we call distorted modes of thinking. Modes of thinking that, that induce the mental health disorder by negatively affecting uh, our uh, emotions our mode, uh, uh, our, uh, and our behavior. I'm, give you, I'm, gonna give you some, give, I'm gonna give you some examples of these, these, kind, these uh, cognitive distortions. They're very recognizable. You've, you've heard them many times uh, before. They're actually a little annoying, but people really become enthralled and fool themselves into believing things that are obviously not true to people that aren't uh, 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 affected by these uh, internalizing disorders. So here's some examples of this. So the, usually in cognitive behavioral therapy, they distinguish 12 types, but it doesn't have to be 12 types. These are just for illustrative uh, purposes. This just to explain to people what we mean by cognitive uh, distortion. And so here's some examples. On the right hand side, you've got some examples. For example, catastrophizing. The evening will be a disaster. I'm not going to the, to the party. It will be horrible. You know, the music will suck. The DJs will be terrible. I'm not going, right? Uh, uh, Dichotomous uh, reasoning. No one will ever, ever like me. I will always be a loser. Yeah? The economy's reasoning, uh, disqualifying the positive. Emotional reasoning, sure, yeah, yeah, I, I got an A plus, but it still feels like I uh, didn't do very well. Yeah. Uh, labeling and mislabeling, I, uh, I'm a total loser. You know, if, if you would say something like that in, in, in our household, at least, about yourself or about others, my mom would kind of tap you on the back of your head and say, don't call names. But apparently, that is a, a style of thinking called a cognitive distortion that is quite prevalent among people who suffer from depression and anxiety. Uh, mind reading. Everybody believes I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Everybody thinks I'm no good. Right? You can read people's minds and you know what they're thinking and it negatively affects your, uh, your well-being. Anyway, so that's sort of some examples of uh, cognitive distortions. And so what we did is we, we, uh, we were looking for uh, sort of an AI or machine learning algorithm that could read tweets or social media content and detect these cognitive distortions in the content that people wrote. So rather than to look for emotional markers, we were looking for markers of cognitive distortions. And that led us on a sort of a wild goose chase that led to some really disturbing results. I've got five minutes, yeah, well, I'll get it done. So what we did is we had a group of experts put together a lexicon that uh, sort of that encapsulated the lexical markers involved in expressing cognitive distortions in language. To give you an example, something like I am a. No matter what you say, when you, when you use the words I am a in that sequence, that is a marker that you're performing a labeling. It's it, it, a cognitive distortion of labeling. It doesn't matter whether you say I'm a winner, I'm a loser, you are labeling yourself. It's, it's a form of dichotomous reasoning because when you say I am a loser, you're nothing else. That's who you are, right? So that's a dichotomous reasoning. Um, everyone thinks, obviously, mind reading. So we put uh, about 250 of these engrams together in the lexicon, which allowed then the computers to look for these lexical markers in people's online content and then determine whether someone had exhibited a very high level of cognitive distortions, perhaps even at a, at a pathological level or associated with depression. In fact, here's the lexicon, I'm not gonna show all of this, but uh, in fact, that's what we did. We looked for people that on Twitter uh, reported that they were, had been diagnosed by a doctor or by a psychiatrist with depression. And when uh, they made that statement, again, we harvested all of their tweets and then we subjected those tweets to this analysis where we're looking for the lexical markers of cognitive distortions. And what we, well, and, and again, if you're thinking that people don't do this, yes, they do. They will post their prescription notes on Twitter very easily. Among our youth, it's very common to, to I wouldn't say to brag, but at least to, to, to be very open about your mental health struggles. And for some people you could have, does it is the, the intuition that it, it, for them, it's sort of a, an identity formation uh, exercise. But people will post these things on, on Twitter with the prescription notes, et cetera. So it's not like they're self-diagnosing, they're simply reporting an official diagnosis done by a doctor or by a, a therapist. And so as soon as they do that, we, uh, we download their tweets and then we can look for the lexical markers of cognitive distortions. Again, as you can see, this is, these are very large samples for clinical uh, psychology. In, the case, in this case, we found 1,200 individuals that, that had a confirmed diagnosis of depression and we compared them to a random sample of about 9,000 people. And so what we found is, I'm just gonna skip forward here a little bit, we found that 
at least on Twitter, personalizing, emotional reasoning, overgeneralizing, mental filtering are up to one and a half to 2.2 times more prevalent in the tweets posted by people that suffer from depression. These are absolutely, I mean, if it, the, the, it, the, those are the bootstrap confidence intervals. One means that the, the ratio, the prevalence ratio between the control group and the depressed group is exactly the same. And you can see that for all cognitive distortion types, more, some more than others, uh, the, the difference is highly significant. So it means that the, these cognitive distortions are m truly markers of an underlying pathology. Okay, now that I've, I've, I think I've, to, to some, perhaps to your satisfaction, I demonstrated that we can actually detect these markers, we did something else. Okay, so this is for individuals. Individuals posting tweets, we look at their tweets and then we determine whether those tweets contain markers of cognitive distortions. But okay, well, there's about 400 million, uh, sorry, 300 million tweets. By the time this presentation is done, 250 million people on Twitter. Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, but there's a lot of people on social media, a lot, billions of people. And so the idea is, well, well, let's look at sort of the societal baseline of the expression of cognitive distortion. So then we have something to compare our uh, uh, social media measurements to, because that would allow us to detect how prevalent these, these really damaging cognitive distortions are on social media. So what we did is the following. We uh, had a look at Google Books. I'm, most of you are aware of this. Uh, Google uh, has been involved in a program of scanning the, uh, digitizing the world's literature. Uh, more than 40 million books in 500 languages out of an estimated 130 million distinct titles since the 16th century have been scanned and digitized by Google. So that's a good chunk of the world's literature. In fact, for English, the coverage is, is, is very good and it's, it, it's, I think it's, it's some of the best coverage we have. And so what we did is the following, because Google offers this product. They've taken these digitized books and they've decomposed them into n-grams, one to five grams. So sequences of one, two, three, four, or five words in a sequence. And so you can do things like this. So we want to know, you know, how many people have been talking about hip hop since the 1950s. You can clearly see that hip hop, you know, came into its own in the 2000s and it stayed pretty stable. Disco was still going strong, I'm very happy with this. I'm, I'm a disco house DJ after all. Um, and uh, you can see techno still also really going strong, which makes me even happier because I love techno. Uh, but as you can see, you can actually look at societal trends from these Google books that as they're manifested in the literature that we write, in the, ve the very essence of, of, of the English language itself, as it is written down in these books that Google has been scanning since the well, the, Google hasn't been scanning it since the 16th century, but some of the books really do date back to the 16th and 17th century. And so what we did is we started looking for these cognitive distortion markers in Google books to see what the baseline would be for the uh, English language overall, you know, over the span of 100 and 150 years. You'd expect this to be stationary, right? I mean, English hasn't changed all that much over the past 100 years, and you would certainly not expect markers of cognitive distortions to change. So we, we wanted to get a, a reliable baseline to compare our measurements to. Francis, I know you're going to hold up the, the one minute sign very soon, but I'm almost, almost done. But let me, if this doesn't scare the bejeebus out of you, I don't know what will. Let me show you. This is what we found. So we did an analysis for the past 125 years. So on the right, we have the 1900s. Um, and on the left, we have the 2020s, the present time. We did this for English, Spanish, and German because the languages were available. Google Books has many more languages available, but the nice thing about Spanish is that it's spoken across two continents. Uh, U.S. English is mostly spoken in the U.S., that's the idea, right? And then we also looked at German, which is mostly spoken in, 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 in German. The first thing that sticks out, that's the, the green line here, that's German. As you can see, it's stable for most of its history. So these, these are the, the amount of cognitive distortions embedded in the German language. And you can see that big uh, spike over there in the 1930s and the 1940s. Any idea what that might be related to? No? Uh, it's what uh, Klemper called the language of the Third Reich. They will always think that we will never, always, never, everybody, nobody. It's the, the dichotomized language of fascism that peaked in those days. And you could see it in German, it manifested in German literature. You see the, the, the nationalism, the fascism manifested in the German language. And then it stabilized for quite a while. But look at what happened in the 2000s. That's uh, a two standard deviation, devi uh, standard deviation uh, change relative to the historical trend line for, uh, uh, for German. But look at English. Yeah, okay, perhaps we don't care about the Germans. <laughs> I do, I grew up very close to the German border. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite languages. It's absolutely gorgeous. But look at English. Uh, that's the, uh, the blue line. 
what you can see is a decline for most of the 20th century in the English language. Cognitive, expressions of cognitive distortions became a lot less prevalent starting from the 1900s to about the 1980s, and then something changed. And then you could see like a little, little bit of a, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a surge yet, but a, a return to the uh, historical baseline. And then somewhere in the 19, end of the 1990s and the 2000s, we see these, these spikes of cognitive distortions happening in the English language far above the historical trend line. So what's happening here? This is absolutely scary stuff, I think. Uh, I mean, we, we talk here about the noosphere and sort of this, this utopian idea that because of computer networks and social media and connections, et cetera, will enter some kind of a Valhalla of transcended human consciousness. But what if that human consciousness develops a case of neurosis, develops an internalizing disorder? What if our language, our very language, is shaping our cognition to be much more favorable, favorable to cognitive distortions and, uh, and, we're gonna, and we may suffer the collective effects of this on our well-being, on our mental health st status, and our young may actually be the canneries in a coal mine when it comes to this. So this is really scary stuff. I mean, look at these statistics. I mean, you can literally see from the, from the historical trend in the English language, two standard deviations. That's a lot. And you can say, oh, that's just book language, but we see, we see similar results on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, on, uh, uh, um, uh, on social media, uh, on social media in general. In fact, some people like uh, Greg, I can't pronounce his name, Lukianov and Jonathan Hyde have been calling this the reverse cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy seeks to address cognitive distortions in the individual to improve their well-being, to, to treat depression and anxiety. It may be that on social media, we're all talking ourselves into a case. <laughs> Of, of depression and anxiety because of the language that we use, because we've become so much more favorable, culturally speaking, uh, 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 linguistically speaking, socially speaking, to the expression of cognitive distortions. In fact, Steven Pinker recently uh, <laughs> tweeted about a paper saying that's quite supportive of the reverse cognitive behavioral therapy hypotheses. Um, in fact, I think there's, a, there's an interesting sort of uh, uh, psychosocial hypothesis. Okay, I'm, I'll get off the stage now. Uh, emerging here where uh, again, I, I it can only summarize in the, the degree is that, that our networks are making us ill and our, our youth is paying the price for it. Um, we're getting stuck in these belief traps. It's affecting our politics. It's affecting our well-being. It's affecting our youth. Uh, we should think long and hard about sort of the, the, uh, the environment that we've created online. And just one last thing, chat GPT is very good at generating cognitive distortions. So what could go wrong? OK, well, good luck to all of us. Here's some publications. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
a little like chat GPT is doing here. Someone say the plan is going to hell. What if we just have like these micro one shot intervention? We say, well, the plan is not going to hell. It'll be fine. You know, I mean, we shouldn't lie. I mean, the plan could be going to hell, but at least we could sort of moderate the tone a little bit. That could have disproportionate sort of network effects where we leverage sort of the multiplying effects of these networks and the AIs to push back against sort of a, a culture that is presently evolve, evolving towards what I think is a, a pretty pathological state. I actually asked ChatGPT what could be done about the human impact in the Anthropocene to change our course with regards to the climate crisis. It gave a pretty good plan. The next question I asked it was, could you give us some practical steps? Third Act, you know, uh, uh, no. Extinction Rebellion. I mean, it was was pretty much on yeah, target. Yeah, it's it's much more reasonable than you would expect. Uh, yeah, so I'm not I'm not without hope. I think this can't be fixed, but we just need to be aware of the problem first and and and, and acknowledge it and not do not engage in magical thinking. Uh, well, if nobody else wants to ask a question, I want to ask a question to Raphael, which is. Uh, whether he can make a connection be between the kind of anguish he was speaking about and the kind of emotions that uh, Johan has been uh, measuring. It's very nice of you to ask this question because I was just thinking about that and thinking that actually what he's describing as um, what's happening on the internet for me is the product of the what I would call the, the comeback of this anxiety that you can't, you can't face and because you can't face it you, uh, you spread it even more through internet, right. and you comment on it, and you comment, and you comment, and you comment on it. And so when you spread it, you spread it, you spread it, you feel that you are filling the gap, the void of your anguish, because you think that you avoid the anguish, but by avoiding the anguish, you just have the anxiety, so the negative part of it. Right. You don't have nothing, nothing else. And so I think what does internet, it just expand the, impossibility we have to believe and so to be responsible of ourselves in this world and to desire positively yeah. things. And I was thinking just to, when I was listening at your talk about the effect of inner speech, because what you are actually showing is when you tell someone, oh, um, I feel bad or I feel great. And after that, you can do it on the internet, you can describe yourself, etc., etc. But what's happening when you are commenting inside? Because it's actually what the Buddhist, the Buddhism is about. For centuries, the Buddhist, they have worked, exactly. in fact, they have worked on inner commentary. Yeah. What, is the, what are the effects? It's, it's almost became a science of how works in air commentary of what I am, I feel bad, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure it will be, there will be something that you could cross, even the data, because they work very empirically. Ancient Buddhists from now, yeah. from-, from That's an interesting, there's an interesting connection also with uh, transcendental meditation. Yeah, uh, the same. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this, this exactly, same. I always tell my students, don't believe your thoughts. Uh, and then they have so many of them. I mean, I recently had a discussion with some of my students in, about sort of internal monologues, and they all claim they have an internal monologue. Yeah. And I don't have an internal monologue. But, you, but because, you know, there, there, are, there are different I think techniques. it's very strange, but they thought I was weird because it was just yeah. a universal experience that they, you know, they, they reported that they had an internal monologue run 24 7 that would stop them from sometimes stop them from sleeping. Now, while they were doing things, they had like a voice tone. Oh, you're you're drinking the coffee. It's not as it's not as hot as it should be, etc. And so, but they, they thought it, they thought I was the weird one out because yeah. I, because I'm capable of quieting that. Because you know the Buddhists, they worked on the reaction of your own mind when you comment in a specific way, yeah. and they actually categorize the different way you comment on your. For instance, you you feel bad, you feel, and so if you comment in a certain way. You think you will feel better, but in fact, it will come back even worse. Exactly. And so they describe it because they try to, to do it very yeah. empirically. Or if you look like you feel bad, just, okay, don't try to avoid it. Just say to yourself, I feel bad. And that's exactly what you describe. And the fact that you tell yourself, I feel bad. And you see that that's not so bad now that I said <laughs> it. You know, it's just and it, this kind of process that they worked on. I'm sure there will be uh, some kind of comparison and work. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I'm very strongly attached to that tradition. Yeah, that, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, this is a question for Johan. Um, what uh, have you considered, or <coughs> have people used um, 
facial recognition of emotions to to gather some data that that so that that will be a way to to bypass the, the problem of uh, self expressing the emotion and yeah, I, 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 I have a student who's working on that, but in general, it's, it's really difficult to do because people lie with their faces. I mean, we're very good at, this, at that as a social species, so it's, it's just not very reliable at uh, all. It's, it's not normally, I mean, uh, I mean from um, body language studies, even politicians, when they lie, it's, it's, they become micro gestures or, or micro things, but yeah, indeed, maybe the... the I mean, also, I will say when they're lying, perhaps there might be markers of specific behaviors or of intent, etc. But it, when it comes to sort of measuring sort of the the sort of the the emotional state of an individual from their facial expressions, that's just that, that that is a very hard task. I don't think that's been solved at all, and it doesn't surprise me because there's in, inherent difficulties with that. I mean, it's, again, it's it's much more efficient to just allow people to tell you how they feel, and then well, and then, then take their word for it. But but I agree. Yeah, I mean, there, there might be possibilities of, of using sort of biophysical measurements. But I'm, I'm doubtful. For example, that there's also been analysis of uh, voice recordings, etc. But the, the, the reliability just isn't there. Okay, thank you. But I, the, yeah, it's a great idea. Thanks so much for a great talk, Johan. I am uh, curious to hear if you all found. Uh, gender difference in the prevalence of this cognitive distortion language in, in part, and the sort of related question is we've done some work recently that just came out in AJPH um, looking at the narratives associated with uh, suicides. Yeah. And um, as I'm sure you know, men who commit suicide often don't have as much sort of clinical indication in terms of like they have a diagnosis they have symptomatology that's associated with clinical diagnosis of depression or other mental health challenges. But we found that there are some indicators of something going wrong that is just different from what is normally looked for clinically. So could you talk about the gender and then thinking about how to scale up sort of the net of what right. we look for in terms of signs of mental health disruption uh, beyond the scope of what's associated in that tight way with clinical diagnosis. Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I did not ask Jacob to ask that question, but you know, we do see very strongly gender differences in the expression of cognitive distortions, which also matches what we know about sort of the prevalence of, the, of internalizing disorders. I, uh, I think women in general have much higher prevalence of uh, internalizing disorders than, 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 than men do. Um, when it comes to suicide and when it comes to the, the, there's some really interesting dynamical models I'm working on with my colleagues in, in Wageningen, you know, Macht und Schäfer, where they actually uh, take ecological models of, 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 of systems collapsing, like ecological systems collapsing, uh, collapsing. For example, you've got a lake. Lake is healthy, there's fish, there's little plants, there's birds, and whatever have you. And there's a little bit of affluent, like fertilizer running into the lake. More algae, becomes a little more turbid more of the fish die, the plants don't get enough light, et cetera. And sooner or later, that lake will make what we call a clinical transition, where it will, will drop off that fold, uh, fold into an equilibrium that is very stable, but pathological. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, this stereosis is enormous. You, you, I mean, you can't just put, put, put some fish in the lake because they'll die, but put some plants in the lake, <laughs> it'll stay dead for a long time. And you, you, you're really forced to recreate the entire ecology. So these, 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 these critical transitions are very dangerous because when they happen, it's, it's essentially game over. And so they've been able to show that if you look at people suffering from depression and uh, people also with suicidal ideation and anxiety, et cetera, that if you look at their, 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 their cognitive and affective state, that you can actually see these transitions, mm. these critical transitions have to go very quickly. Once that feedback loop gets going, there's actually sort of network theories of depression say depression doesn't really exist. It's just a, a system of self-reinforcing symptoms. And once that system gets going, that feedback loop get, gets going, the system can drop into a pathological equilibrium very quickly. But the good news is, to your point, that before a system does that, usually the, its resilience is affected. And you can, you can detect sort of the resilience of, of these dynamical systems decreasing uh, if you look at their variance and their autocorrelations. So the system starts to slow down. It's called critical slowing down. And it's a little bit like someone balancing on a, on, on a single leg, right? And as you're doing yoga, and as your leg becomes tired, you start to you start to sway. So your variation increases, 
but your autocorrelation increases as well because you're moving slower. You're not making those fine adjustments anymore before you drop over. And so there's been a lot of work done also in my lab uh, uh, in collaboration with this group at Wageningen where we're looking at early warning indicators in people, uh, people's affective and cognitive states that are, that are pointing towards the possibility of, of, of uh, re reduced resilience and the probability of the system actually, I wouldn't say collapsing, but dropping into a pathological equilibrium. So there's, there's some really interesting signs there, you know, on the, on the level of complex adaptive systems that can be done there. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Yeah.